Welcome, everybody, to The Thoughtful Bro. We are live streaming on a mighty blaze. Um, we are here every Tuesday at 2 for what makes great books tick and uh, what makes great authors tick. Uh, and boy, do we have a show for you guys today. Um, a few words before we get started. Um, for those who may not know, A Mighty Blaze is an all-volunteer initiative to help writers reach readers virtually um, during COVID and beyond. Um, you can find scores and scores and scores of our interviews uh, on The Mighty Blaze Facebook page um, and on our YouTube pages. Recent interviews include Anne Lamott, Jonathan Leatham, John Irving, Edwidge Dandicat, Erica Jong, Mark Lehner, Caroline Kepnes, and many, many more. We do about six to 10 new interviews every week. Um, <clears throat> on A Mighty Blaze, we are not asking for money. Um, you can support us by liking us and following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, if you're new, just give us a like, give us a follow. Um, you can subscribe to our weekly podcast, wherever podcasts are sold or given out. It's free. Um, you can also go to our website, amightyblaze.com, and subscribe to our weekly newsletter to get a schedule of upcoming authors. Um, if you are, in fact, in the mood to spend money right now and just opening a tab and clicking the buy button, um, I would encourage you to buy A Swim in a Pond in the Rain by George Saunders. Um, it is a great, great book, which you will soon learn much more about. Um, so if you have uh, any questions for uh, George, please pop them in the chat as usual. They will make their way to me. Um, and just a quick tease for next week, um, I'll have on uh, Sanjana um, Sathian. She's a debut author with a super buzzy uh, new book of literary fiction called Gold Diggers. Um, so that's next week um, at two on The Thoughtful Bro. But on to this magnificent week. Um, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce George Saunders. Um, Saunders is the author of 11 books, including Lincoln and the Bardo, which won the 2017 Man Booker Prize for Best Work of Fiction in the English Language, um, the audiobook for Lincoln and the Bardo, which featured a cast of 166 actors, won the 2018 Audi Award, Audi Award for Best Audiobook. Um, Saunders' stories have appeared regularly in The New Yorker since 1992. Um, his short story collection, The 10th of December, was a finalist for the National Book Award. He's received the MacArthur and Guggenheim Fellowships, the Penn Malman Prize for Excellence in, in the Short Story, and he's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. In 2013, Time Magazine named George Saunders one of the world's 100 most influential people in the world. Um, and he's taught since 1997 creative writing um, at Syracuse University. His new book uh, called A Swim in a Pond in the Rain is a masterclass in fiction um, based upon a course uh, that George has been teaching for years, um, in which um, he examines seven classic Russian short stories for how they work and just generally expounds uh, on his views on the methods and potential uh, for fiction and how it can enrich our lives. So George Saunders, a hearty, hearty welcome to The Thoughtful Bro. Nice to be here, Mark. Thanks for having me. You got it. You got it. So I just want to actually acknowledge at the top of the interview, George is on a satellite internet connection. So there might be a little delay in some of the audio or the video, but in the green room, it sounded great. So, um, so, uh, for this interview, we're going to talk about um, some of George's theories about um, fiction writing that come up in this work. Um, we're going to talk about how writers find their voice and as well, how they can build structure within their fiction and a major teaser for you. Um, George in the book talks about the two things that most determine whether an author will succeed or not. And now that I have your attention, I will save those towards the end. Um, but George, um, why don't you just start by telling us what the book is about? Yeah, well, I, as you said, I, I've been teaching this class for 20 years at Syracuse. And in the class, we just take um, usually about 40 uh, Russian short stories and kind of treat them like 40, you know, bodies on the slab, basically. So since the writers are dead and they can't yell at us and the, and the stories are a little bit old fashioned, you know, so in a way it gives you a chance to just say, all right, what is the story? How does it how does it work at its most basic level? Um, and so we just week after week, we just take these things on. And the whole point of that class really is to kind of I always joke that it, we're just uh, reading to see what we can steal. But on a deeper level, you're kind of uh, lowering yourself into these stories in an analytical, technical way in the hope or the faith that that stuff will kind of percolate into your artistic body in ways that you can't predict. So in the book, um, I mean, partly I, I got I'm getting to the a place in my teaching where I'm teaching less and I may not actually teach this class physically again. So I kind of just wanted to enshrine it, you know, or kind of like 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 see if uh, put it down on paper while it was still fresh. The second goal was kind of just to get in touch with the story form 
a new, you know, before I start that, whatever the next thing is. So um, basically out of those 40, I picked seven of the stories that teach the best and tried to arrange them into an order that would be the, you know, the, the least repetitious. And that, that ended up being this beautiful two year adventure where I got to basically read nothing but these stories for two years and, and try to write about them. So. I love the anecdote in your book where you say that s some of the happiest moments in your entire life have been working through these stories in this class. Um, yeah, that's, it's amazing. And I just, and just to clear yeah. up about the class, like you say that this class there's 600 or more applicants for six spots. Is that, is that right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So we, every February, yeah. I don't, I don't do it anymore, but for 20 years, we, we get six or 700 applications uh, of 30 pages each and read through them, uh, f four or five of us. And then you pick, you know, you pick and, and at Syracuse, we often get the top six that we pick. So they're already off the charts. They're wonderful people who have lived full lives and they're great writers. They've always been the best writers wherever they go, you know? So it's a really unique uh, kind of teaching. It's just, it's like, um, it's not teaching anybody to write. They've, they've known that for years, but it's just, sort of a more almost like Zen, you know, almost psychological type judo activity where you're trying to get them to do whatever it is they're meant to do that, that hopefully only they can do. So that's a really fun, fun job. <laughs> I, I can't even imagine how like you would decide the difference between the sixth person who makes it and the seventh who doesn't, <laughs> it must be almost impossible. Yeah. Well, what's funny, it, it, you would think so. And, and at first when you start, it's just like, ah, uh, either these are all great or nobody's any good. I can't tell. And then as you, <laughs> as the days and weeks go by, your sensor gets adjusted and you start to see what's good and what's not. And then within that, you start to fall in love with certain writers. And you, then you start to be willing to fight for those. And then the really crazy thing is then you, we go into a big meeting and we each have 10 of those people that we love. So there's 40 mm. people on the table. And you know, oh so gosh. it's really a, it's a, well, it's if nothing else. It's a great chance to see what you believe in in fiction, to see, you know, what you actually respond to when you're, when you're having to read for six hours a day, you know, mm -hmm. what you get tired of, uh, you, you become hyper attuned to agenda or falseness in a story. And you be also become hyper attuned to, uh, that beautiful moment when there's an, another human being on the other end of the prose, you know? So I, I used to of course dread it, but also it was sort of lovely to, to be reminded uh, of how discerning you can be as a reader, you know, how much yeah. you can prefer this over that. Uh, and, and I always came away from that a little more sharp in my writing because I, I knew what I wanted to do and I knew what I wanted to avoid in some ways. Right. So, George, let's get into like what the actual substance of the book is. These seven Russian short stories, they're by Chekhov, Turgenev, Gogol and, and Tolstoy. Um, you know, just to give a bit of background, you describe these seven stories as from the high water period of the short story form. And, you know, it really does strike me that way that, you know, you had... You know, there, there's other moments of kind of this confluence of talent and geography in time where you have, you know, the early 1500s in Italy uh, for painting and sculpture, and you have Vienna in the early 1800s for music and the Russian short story in the late 1800s. And, and I just, I also feel like this period is sort of one of these major kind of inescapable blocks of the traditional Western canon. It's sort of like the Greeks, the Bible, Shakespeare, the Russians. I mean, I don't know what else is on that list, but this period and these writers are on that list. And I guess my question to you then is, I know maybe this is more of a question for a historian or a cultural historian, but do you have a theory about why this happened the way it did? I have a loose theory, which is that when, when a, a culture is in transition and they were in, you know, just before a radical transition and, and they, mm. they almost got to the breaking point in many ways, then I think, uh, you know, the art flourishes. It can, it can flourish. Yeah. In this case, you had the added thing that there was a certain element of censorship involved. So the, the, uh, you know, sometimes we talk about constraint being a powerful, uh, aid to art. They were under a big constraint, which is the czar, you know, so that, uh, so I don't really, I don't really know, but I, my feeling is it's, it was just a time when there was a lot up in the air morally and, and socially. And of course it, it made its way into the form just at the moment that the form was deciding what it was, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I suppose a parallel would be like uh, America, the, you know, rock and roll music in the sixties. It, it, it was a form that was um, kind of just coming into its own as a distinct thing at a time when the culture had a lot to say. 
but again, I, I think I could have written a similar book about any literature, really, if I love them as much as I do the Russians and if I'd been teaching them for 20 years. It's a it's not, you know, I don't I really early in the book, I kind of wash my hands of being any kind of expert on things <laughs> Russian. It's just uh, these are just stories that I kind of use in my development. So they teach for me, they teach naturally that, you know, right. It is an interesting thing. I once heard an interview with the British philosopher Bertrand Russell, who said that Shakespeare never would have written his plays if the British hadn't defeated the Spanish Armada in whenever that was the 1580s. And it, I mean, I just that that comment really struck me at the time. But it's just such an interesting question about like what precipitates yeah. these things. And, and in Russia, as you mentioned in the book, so rightly, there is a complete collapse of, of this kind of culture almost immediately and this horrific culture that follows this period. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, th I, I, I like to think, you know, in my own development, um, I always try to use as a touchstone the idea of uh, kind of like, what do I want? What do I need to say? What do I want to say? What's urgent? I don't want to just be like a, a lazy hobbyist. I, you know, so I think in these Russians, you feel that the culture was speaking through them, uh, asking a lot of questions about, um, you know, what, what should what should we be doing? You know, I get a culture with an incredible gulf between the rich and the poor. I mean, incredible, uh, incredibly cruel. Um, and so I think the, the, a, a culture's neurosis will, will come through its art. And here it was just the, the sort of coincidence that the, that the art was new, the people were bold, and I think they were feeling around to see what the limits of the form were, just as in the 60s, or maybe if you go back to the 40s and 50s in jazz, nobody really knew what it was. It wasn't in a museum yet. So I think some of that was going on, but that's just a guess. I don't know. Right. All right. So um, and then as far as um, oh, I, I did have one other question I wanted to ask you on that. So uh, I, I'm just I have to ask if, if that's the high watermark for the short story form. I mean, here you are, one of the great living practitioners of the short story form. Where are we relative to that high watermark in American short fiction? Yeah, I, you know, that's funny you should ask, because I uh, am reading Dubliners this week by James Joyce. And I'm really asking that, you know, my, my mm -hmm. only I mean, the one answer is we're in a degraded condition relative to them. You know, we're, we're at the end of the cycle and, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're involved in an art form, which is somewhat past its vitality. I don't really believe that or I wouldn't be doing it. So what I prefer to believe is that the form evolves to meet the needs of the time. And of course, at any given moment, the form will look more classic in its earliest earlier incarnation because it's had a, a chance to solidify and to have theory done about it. So mm -hmm. my hope is that whatever we're doing now that might look like degradation or, you know, um, more vernacular language, simpler forms, uh, less active metaphors, as we see in these Russians, maybe I'm hoping that's part of what the form needs to speak to our time. And in, in right. 50 years, there'll be a whole other vo vocabulary of aesthetics that will um, refer to what we're doing. But we do, you know, we do the best we can. And it's certainly possible that we live in a degraded era. I, I think that's, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> they, they do occur. You know. Right. <laughs> I, I also think it's like really, really difficult to kind of judge what era one is in as well. So, I mean, time yes. will tell, I suppose. Um, but so let's talk yeah. about, I mean, this kind of aesthetic um, vocabulary that, that you're talking about. Um, so this is like absolutely something that immediately jumped out at me um, in terms of the stories and the time period that you chose. I mean, we have seven stories. They're all written in a realist tradition, except for The Nose by Goggle, um, which is a great um, absurdist um, tale. Um, and it's also, I want to point out that all of these stories are um, formally very traditional. Uh, there's not a lot of um, language experimentation, kind of variation of the storytelling mode. So what you have is um, realist, traditional storytelling here at this high watermark, and that's fine. I mean, that's that's what it was at the time. But what's interesting to me about it is you're the one bringing these seven stories as you know um, the, the, the high watermark, and your work in those two categories, at least couldn't be more different. This is like what you're known for is just this, the fantastical, the speculative, even the supernatural element, the, the formal experimentation. So I just want to like kind of uh, square this apparent, you know, just, you know, yeah. the way it doesn't fit together. Right. For me, it's not, not as much of a dichotomy because I, my sense about fiction has always been that it's there to communicate uh, in a way that's more exquisite than normal speech you know a, a, mm -hmm. a story is a super rarefied rhetorical tool 
And it's supposed to have, in my view, a moral ethical urgency so that we, we, we write it and we go, oh, shit, did we ever need that? But we didn't know we needed it until we saw it because it so perfectly answers our needs. So in that sense, I, the, the means by which that happens, whether it's realism or not, I really never cared about that. What I found early was I, if I thought of my, uh, the story as a realist story, I couldn't pull it off. You know, now I, that's a whole other bag, but I, I just couldn't do it. I, I, so, you know, being a survivalist, I've swerved away from that. And at the same time, I, I found out that for me, what's urgent, what needs to be said urgently can't be said in that mode. And conversely, mm. the stuff that I was saying in this kind of weird mode seemed to have much more to do with my real life than those stories I was writing about fishing for trout in Asia or whatever the hell it was. So, so I don't really make a big distinction between realism and not, because when you get inside the stories, as I try to do in this book, there's no realism. There's right. no story that is an accurate, faithful, encyclopedic account of a human moment, because that can't be done. So the question is, do you choose to appear to be real? Or do you just do away with that and play, you know? So for me, this, the latter choice is the one that just yields more sparks. But I don't, I'm, I, I would say in my intention is I'm absolutely one with Chekhov and one with Tolstoy in my, in what I hope my fiction will do. The means, you know, that remains to be seen. Yeah. And, and one of the, I, I've heard you say that one of the things that you feel overlap with the Russians, that they just admire so much about the Russians, regardless of the, the mode of presentation, is the way they were willing to go after the big, big questions in life. And so you kind of are entering by a different door, but would you agree that that's a major area of overlap? A hundred percent. And and I just, by big questions in life, I don't even mean necessarily philosophical ones, but I mean, you know, if, if the two of us have been friends for 15 years and we talk, what are we, you know, what are we talking about? What, or the other way I said is what keeps you up at night? You know, when, when you clear away the kind of detritus of the day, what are you ecstatic about? What are you worried about? What's the conundrum we're in here on earth? And um, I, I find myself getting kind of bored with fiction that isn't about that or any art. The Russians are in one way or other, they're about, you know, what should our relation be to this, life you know and um so that so yeah that's and that's definitely what my my stuff tries to do now the funny thing is that it doesn't you don't get there by trying to do that and that that's maybe the <clears throat> subtext of the book you don't just say oh i'm gonna write about the big questions and do it but there's some other some other things involved that have to do with experiential states that you're in as you're working and so on that you know that's a whole different topic i guess well, I mean, I, this is another question I was going to ask later, but it's it's apropos right now, which is that um, I just reread uh, Lincoln and the Bardo, um, which is a work that I just love, love, love. And um, thank you. One thing about that work that struck me so much is um, it's this question that I think writers face a lot about: what is the way into a work? Um, and I, I feel mm -hmm. that like this is something that you are so adept at. And I, it's funny, I saw a Ninety Second Street Y talk that you and Colson Whitehead gave, and, uh, and he's talking about Underground Railroad, you're talking about Lincoln and the Bardo. And to me, that pairing was inspired because you're both talking about two things that are two of the most written about things in American history, slavery on the one hand and Abraham Lincoln on the other. And yet both of you find a completely original, idiosyncratic way of approaching this material that renders it fresh. And I guess I just kind of wanted to ask you about that. Like, do you agree that this is such an important issue about how to get into, uh, how to enter a work? Yes. It's the only issue, really, because it, <laughs> once you get into it on the right basis, the, the work will start asking you the right questions, which then you'll know the answer to. So whereas if you get into it on the wrong basis, you, it, you, you can't proceed. So for me, I'll tell you honestly, and that's a, that's, I've never been asked that question just that way, and I thank you for it. To me, the, the thing is, I want you to believe it. I want you, Mark, to believe it. And I want you to not be able to close the book because you believe it so much. That's really about 100% of it. All the other stuff, I think, comes out of that. You know, if you're moved by it, if you're, if you know, if you, if your political view changes or whatever, that, that can only happen if you stay in it. So for me, I think 90% of the time when I'm working, maybe more, I'm just asking myself, would a reasonable reader still buy this? You know, and, and that's, of course, charged by the fact that she shouldn't. It's made up, you know. I'm, I'm yeah. making the shit up, and yet, that you can still do something in in the alchemy of the words to make the person. And, and you know, in neuroscience, would explain that as saying, yeah, it's very close to an actual memory. If I express 
express something in an English sentence correctly, it it sits there in your brain right next to your actual experience. So I, I think that, you know, as a practitioner, that's almost all I worry about is how do I say this and what tack do I take through the material so that the reader will be uh, what John Gardner calls the um, the fictive spell, I think he called it or something like that. You know, the, the idea that you're suddenly not reading words, you're, you're experiencing something. And that's a huge, I mean, that's a huge undertaking, but it's, I, I think of it, you know, as a son of a, of a salesman, I think of it as an honorable hustle. You know, if, if I'm trying to make you think that Abraham Lincoln is, a, is in a graveyard, well, there are ways I can do that. You're, that you're not going to believe. And there are ways that, that you will believe. And so part of my working life is to figure out what, what those are. And I think you, for me, you do that a lot by instinct and by trying to imagine, trying to imagine yourself as that reader. You know, if, if so-and-so said, uh, it was a dark and blustery night in February during the height of the civil war and our president, Abraham, I'm already out of that, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, so that's the game, you know, as much as we yeah. talk about writing, I think that's, that's the game. Just like for an actor, you know, what's an actor's job to convince you he's not an actor. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, that book just, it impacted me profoundly. And, and like you said, if somebody said, I'm going to write a book about Lincoln, I'd be like, okay, well, there's about 800 books about Lincoln that got published last week. If you said, I'm going to write a book about yeah. fathers and sons or the death of a child, I'd be like, well, 800 books about that published last week. But then you have come up with this doorway that basically opens into this kingdom. And because I haven't gone through that doorway before, I'm just all in, you know? But that's exactly what you said. That's exactly what I said to myself. You know, and don't do it. You, there's so many books about Lincoln. Don't do it. It's maudlin, you know. And then that that becomes part of the writer's armor because he's, you know, I, there's a um, there's a, a guy named Stuart Kornfeld, a, a movie producer who just passed away this year. Good, great guy, good friend. And he, we were talking about a script one time, and I and he was proposing this one scene for me to write, and I said, I don't know, you know, if it, if if we don't film it right, that'll be really really saccharine. And he kind of right. took a beat, and he goes how about we film it right? You know, mm. so, so the, the, the part of the writer's job is to imagine the ways that the book could go into the ditch and then just keep saying no to self. Don't do that. You know, I mean, it okay. sounds a little facile, but if you, you know, in, in all things, we first see, uh, we, we have to know how to thread the needle. And I think that's what originality is about. And that's what formal innovation is about. And that's also what revising is about really. Don't do it the bad way. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. Your whole course in, in one sentence. Don't do it the bad way. Um, all right. Yeah, that's so it. I, right. right. Yeah, I, I, was, I was thinking about having you kind of explain one of the stories that you take apart uh, in this book, but I think I'm actually going to skip that. And I just would say to folks, like, it is deeply enriching to read these stories and, and hear George unpack them and analyze them in the book. And that's definitely the meat of the book. I just thought it would take up a lot of time and it wouldn't do the story justice for us to try to do that again on this call. So I'm actually just going to um, kind of talk about some of the more the theoretical, the, the ideas that you have about fiction writing, um, but just would encourage everybody to read this book. It's just so mm -hmm. fantastic. And by the way, the reason why I even have George on the show is because um, three different writer friends of mine in one week, independent of each other, all wrote to me and said, have you read this book? It's one of the best books, if not the best book I've ever read on the fiction craft. One of them had the qualifier, it is the best book on fiction craft I have read by a factor of 100. So um, so uh, people love this book and I just wanna say- my mother. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, she's on my text. No, no just kidding. Um, so, um, a writer. right. Um, so anyway, um, so we're going to move on to like some of these ideas that uh, are so central to kind of um, how George approaches fiction. I think these would be very fruitful. Um, so the first is structure. Now, I find your ideas about structure very, um, very interesting and um, very, very clear. I mean, you, you definitely stake out a very clear position in the book about structure. And it comes from, you know, you explain it in a number of different ways, but you talk about how it's about following the voice and kind of like, where is the spark? And that you may not know why a certain sentence strikes you as having heat and energy in it, but you have to just, it's your kind of religious bound duty to follow this as a writer. Um, and, and you describe the way structure kind of comes from the spark um, in this way that it's it's organic and it's kind of almost accidental. Um, and I thought this metaphor you had in the book was just totally rich and brilliant. And it, like, it, bear, it bore a lot of scrutiny, which is this metaphor that any line of your work is like a piece of DNA. It's like a DNA cell or whatever you call it, DNA. Um, it's this micro unit that contains the instructions 
for the entire body of the work. And you can imagine a little DNA replicating and replicating. And then in the end, you have a human that is fully balanced and fully structured. But this structure is something that evolves from the compounding of these micro units. I found that metaphor astonishing. And I just want you to talk about it a little bit. Yeah, well, first, let me, let me I want to make like a sort of a <laughs> general disclaimer. I, in the book, I, I'm really, uh, and in, in, as a person, I'm really allergic to writing advice because anybody who's done it above a certain level knows that it's every story has its own internal climate and its own internal rules. And uh, so I'm very wary of that. But but what I try to do in the book is say, let's let's enter these stories and just notice certain uh, tendencies or certain expectations that the form sets up. So I don't mean any of this to be rules or, or formulas. That, that's not my thought. But in teaching, what I'll do is I'll just throw out a metaphor like that. Uh, and the idea is if three kids out of 20 find it helpful, and helpful is the word I really want to concentrate on, right. then that's great. And, and I encourage my students, if they don't find it helpful, just brush it right away quickly. Don't, it's, none of this is law. None of it is theory. It's, it's all just um, metaphors. It's like if somebody was looking at somebody drowning and started trying to shout out instructions, ah, you know, try kicking your feet. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really in that, in that spirit. So, but yeah, so I, th what I'm saying about structure is that basically, um, when I'm telling you a story, you, even the simplest story, questions are arising in your mind. So if I say, you know, once upon a time, there was a two headed dog. That's my first sentence. You, already there's things you want to know. You can kind of picture it. You might be thinking what happens at mealtime. Did the two heads get along? Are they are they identical? You know, th these kind of questions just naturally come up. And also maybe somewhere in there we see, oh, yeah, this story is going to be about the binary, you know, or it's going to be about factions You know, in that kind of not that we're thinking this overtly, but these things come up in a little cartoon bubble of our head. OK, so my contention is that then the story has now got an obligation of sorts or to say it's got something with which to work, you know. If the story swerves off and never mentions the two heads again, we feel that as a failure of organization. So structure in a way in, in my, and, and again, the only reason I would even say this is because it might help me to do it. You know, you don't get any points for writing down the rule of structure, but if it helps you proceed, <laughs> then that's great. So for me, I think structure, forget about structure, just be aware of what questions your story is asking and mm. please be there to catch them, catch the answers to them. Yeah. Also be aware that it might, those questions will change. But structure in that way is a kind of call of response. The first section says, Romeo's so in love with Juliet. And we go, oh, what's he gonna do about it? He's gonna go to her house, you know? So in, you know, structure and theme and all that stuff can be so terrifying. And there's been so much written in a formulaic way about it. But for me, the trick is to get it inside your heart and go, yeah, well, okay. so." I just have to know what question I'm causing my reader to ask, which is going to be somewhat similar to the ones I'm asking. Okay, we're okay, and we, and we can proceed. Right. You know? So in that way, yeah. If you if you know, when I say once upon a time there was a dog with two heads, there's a there is a maybe there's a group of stories that come out of that DNA of that sentence, and it has to do with the way I the voice. Um, it has to do with uh, the questions that arise. It has to do with all kinds of things, but it's not random after that point, which is scary. And, and, and I guess it's scary and good. Right. And, you know, there's a metaphor that you, another metaphor, there's so many great writing metaphors in this book, but another one you said is like, you know, you know, the, you're, you're stressing how organic uh, the development of the short story has to be. And you say that, you know, to plan out your story in a way is like going on a date and the, the date starts at seven and you think at 7.15, I'm going to tell her I like what she's wearing. At 7.30, I'm going to tell this really funny joke. And da, da, da. And I guess I, my question about that is like, but is structure eat more like, well, at seven, we're going to go to the restaurant. At nine, we're going to go to the movie. And at 11, we're going to go to the bar. Like, isn't there like some kind of vague structure that you might have that's not so specific? Yes, for sure. And, and this, you know, this is the other thing is might is the operative word. If it works, mm -hmm. and again, after teaching so many years at Syracuse, if it works for a student, I'm 100% for it. I, I have mm -hmm. no pr pr investment in my method, except for, for me. Uh, but also I'm always undercutting my own method because with Lincoln there was exactly the kind of structure you just mentioned you know mm. Lincoln's going to come in the graveyard 
stay for some period and then leave for some reason. Willie's there. He shouldn't be. He's either going to stay or he's not. So 100 percent, you know, th these things are never I, I can't imagine a, a single rule that I would say to a writer. You absolutely have to do this. That that right. does not work, you know. So, for again, for me, structure, what I found just for me, and I think by extrapolation for some other people I've taught, if you have too much structure in place, then it tends to lock you in. And what that means is you're like somebody driving on a trip out west who never looks out the window. And, and you know, in other words, your story might be presenting you with beautiful options. And because you're so hell-bent on sticking to the plan, you don't go there. And actually, I would contend that a reader is really just wants those moments. They want the moments when the language lights up or when something surprising happens. So a, a, two, uh, a plan that you stick to too strongly, like that date, it, the main thing is it just keeps you from being there. You know, it keeps you from being truly open to what's actually happening. And therefore the best you can hope for is that you'll get through the evening and be remembered as a sort of condescending person, <laughs> you know, who hit all his marks, you know, the date from hell. Um, yeah. See right, that on so your, um, on your online profile. Right. Um, all right, folks. So I know we have a lot of questions from the audience and we'll get to them in a little bit. I have a few other things I wanted to get through. Um, George, I really want to um, shift over to voice now. Um, voice is something, again, that you're just you're a real pioneer in this field. This is one of the things you're best known for. And you have so many great things to say about voice. And I just kind of want to like tear through a few of the awesome things you say um, about voice. You say, um, a writer has to write in whatever way produces the necessary energy. Um, we have little choice in what kind of writer we will turn out to be. Um, ultimately, finding one's voice is about which of the many voices inside us is the most energetic. Um, and then ultimately, there's a piece of advice that I really love and that you kind of put at the top of the, of the book, which is, your ultimate goal with all your students is get them to write the story that only they can write. So all these quotes are sort of about that right. in a way. And I guess to put a point on the question, how do you, A, like how do you write the story only you can write? And how do you know that you've done that? Yeah. I, I was just laughing because if somebody who just disavowed giving advice, that's a lot of that's a lot of uh, direct <laughs> quotes. That would, uh, I'm doing this I, to I you. Think, I'm doing um, the book isn't like this. No, 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 <laughs> no, no. And and actually, the in, in, the class is like that. And what I say at the beginning of the class is, I'm going to sound so sure of myself, you know. And I and I can be pretty charming. So that's my job is to is to give you a lot to push back on, and then their job is to push to push back as necessary, but also to be open to the moments when they find some agreement, you know? So, um, I, I think, well, for me, again, this is just for me, but I found that my best friend has been revision hundred percent. Uh, and by revision, I mean like really tearing things up and moving stuff around and throwing away sections and, you know, but also sometimes going, Oh, you wrote that perfect the first time, leave it. That is, I think where you, it's where you find voice. And my theory is, and it's true for me, uh, if you have a swath of prose that you wrote, that actually doesn't have your true voice in it yet. You, to get your true voice in it, you got to go through and make a bunch of choices on a bunch of different days in a row. Uh, iteration is, is part of it. Will that produce your voice? It will. Because what you're basically doing is you're reacting to all the places that sound mediocre or they sound banal or they sound like anybody else could have written them. Another way of saying it is you're micro choosing phrase by phrase what you think will light the reader's mind up, which is what will light your right, your, your mind up as you're revising. So that's the way to get a voice. I think, um, that's also the way to finish the story because as you're doing that, you're kind of ruling out the falseness, you know, you, you're, you're, um, sometimes for example, you'll, your story will go in the expected direction. And after a while that will offend you and you'll back out of that and say that, that every time I get to that place, I just go, yeah, 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 of course. Hmm. I don't want that effect. So you back up and you try again. So I think to me, revision is really the answer to just about everything. Mm. Um, how you know you're done. Yeah, exactly. That's a tough one. I, I think in a way though, it's it has something to do with maybe, maybe like, um, if you're thinking about working out, you know, how do you know your body's in the best possible shape? Well, you've been in, pre, you know, previous to now you've been in your best shape ever once and you remember it. 
and you're kind of mentally going, well, you know, so I think, you know, once you, what I found is once you turn a corner on a story, once your you know, your stories get better, better, better. And in one day there's a, there's a leap forward where suddenly you're like, oh, wow, that's a short story. Once you revise a story into that condition, you never want to settle for less and you maintain a kind of vestigial memory of what it feels like to finish something which by the way is always going away you know you forget but i think that's the trick is having been down the road uh once to mile eight you kind of know that you're only at mile four you know also there are certain things from in my experience that happen when a story is being finished um it's it's and I won't, I won't listen, but there, there's a kind of a list of recognizable thing. Like, oh yeah, I remember that's, that always happens when I'm almost done. Uh, mm. So I, I think probably each person learns that list for him or herself too, which is the other pisser about this whole thing is there is no general advice. You know, there's only your prior experience. You know? So um, I want to pivot from that into kind of a little bit about your story and kind of how you found your voice, because there's just several um, great things that you talk about in the book about that. And, um, and it was in many ways, the most moving part of the book for me, but I just, um, there was two quick anecdotes and I know you've told them before, but, um, I kind of came to them the first time, uh, researching for this interview, but one is this advice that one of your mentors, Tobias Wolf gave to you at a party one time. And then the other is the moment you found your voice with, uh, you know, your wife looking at your, some writing that you'd done at work. Could you just tell us those two stories? Cause I think they're so great. Yeah, well, the first one was I, you know, I had written a really crazy story uh, to get into Syracuse that would actually years later have been right at home in my first book, kind of a sci-fi crazy first person story. And as soon as I got to Syracuse, I disavowed it. Like now I'm in a real writing program with real writers here on the East Coast. And at a party, I went up to Tobias Wolf, who's my, my, my dear friend and hero. And I said, uh, Toby, just so you know, uh, you know, I, I know you read that crazy story I, I submitted, but now I'm off that and I'm just writing real literature now. And he's a gr great teacher because sometimes he just lets you, you know, fall down the stairs. And, and I, so I said that and he just kind of looked over his glass and went, good. Well, don't lose the magic, which is exactly the right advice, you know. And then but he also knew, I think, that you sometimes have to. You have, you know, like I really at that point had made a divide between experimental stupid crap that was trivial and serious literature that had nothing to do with the way I was actually living. So I had to go off and, you know, mess up for a few years. And then when I finally did write what, what would be the first book, the first story in Civil Warland, I sent it to him and I was laughing because I thought, oh, that's exactly what I did. I went off and lost the magic for five or six years. But his advice was almost like a buried treasure because when I did write that story i thought ah the magic you know so it was a yeah. great uh, seated seated teaching and then the second thing was just that i had written um uh well at the end of that period i'd written this big book called la boda de eduardo which means like ed's wedding and it was this very i mean hideously autobiographical account of a wedding i'd just been to in mexico oh imagine that uh but i'd kind of james joyceified it by like taking every other verb out you know and, and running words together um so, but I, you know, but I joke about it now, but I spent a long time on it, 700 page book that I then fastidiously cut down to 300 and gave to my wife. And she just, you know, I gave it to her and, you know, the way writers will do like, just, just take your time whenever you can get to it. And then I perched myself outside the room and watched her and she was maybe like three pages in and she just like <sighs> sitting like that, you know? So that produced one of those beautiful slash horrible artistic moments where you just have got nothing left. I'm like, I don't, I, a lot of times re with rejection, you have something ready to go right after that. I just had nothing. I'd been failing for so long. So I just kind of went, Oh, kind of laughed. Like, all right, well, maybe this isn't the job for me and went into work and with a completely non-writing part of my mind, I was just taking notes at a conference call, writing these little Susian poems, these kind of dog roll, you know, and illustrating with pictures. And then, uh, brought that home and, you know, put it on the table. And I heard Paula laughing at, at them, with them, you know. Uh, and it was literally the first time in five or six years that anybody had actually taken pleasure in my work. You know, you you give a story to somebody and they'd be like, yeah, that was really, yeah, I did read it. Yeah, I did. It was very, it was interesting. You know, I can really feel that you worked hard on that. Oh, you know, so this was just like, oh, God, thank God she's taking pleasure in it. And that threw a switch in my head. Um, yeah. It's complicated. But for me, it was about saying, yeah, go ahead and be entertaining. You're supposed to 
people are supposed to like your writing, you know, and, and as a human being, I kind of know how to get people to like me. So maybe there's a relation, you know, between the two and it just, the doors just flew open and, and still was a lot of work ahead, but I, every time I got to a decision point, I sort of knew what to do as opposed to back in that Laboda de Eduardo days, I just was, you know, just throwing shit out, you know, I didn't know what was, I didn't, I didn't even know what questions were I was asking, you know, yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, oh, you know yeah. I, I, I love those stories so much. And, and I just want to say that, like, to me, a deeply, deeply moving part of the book is this moment when you talk about finding your own voice. And, you know, you say that um, I'm just going to paraphrase some of the writing here, but you say, you know, you were an ambitious young writer and you thought that finding your voice would be finding like what you call Hemingway Mountain. But instead, you found Saunders Shithill. And and your mm-hmm. idea was like, you know, you you realize your duty was like, well, it's not Hemingway Mountain, but my job is to make the shithill grow. And and just one other beautiful thing you say is you said that, you know, another w- way you put finding your voice, you said you'd sent these hunting dogs out and hoping they'd bring back this beautiful pheasant. And what do they bring back? But the, the bottom half of a Barbie doll. And you're like, well, mm-hmm. I guess this is who I am. And I just thought it was so moving and such an important kind of crystallization of this moment where kind of ambition reconciles itself with the particular skills of that artist. And that just seems to be a Mm, critical moment in artistic development. Yeah. And the funny thing is I'm still doing that. You know, like I, I tell that story as if, Oh, that's so interesting, but I did it this morning. You know, I'm working on a piece having just, you know, written this book about Tolstoy and Chekhov and the piece I'm writing is not them. It's, it's, I don't know, you know, it's, it's something, but, but then I think, well, what else do you got? And I, and the answer is nothing, you know, th- this is what I'm doing. So it's, it is a, it's a, I say in the book, it's a beautiful moment and it's a heartbreaking moment when you have to say, surprise, surprise, I'm an individual flawed person with a particular set of talents that are not, you know, huge or universal. But then the beautiful part comes and you say, all right, I'm going to put my shoulder to the wheel and I'm going to do the best with what I have. And sometimes I think in that mode, that may be the only mode where anybody, including Tolstoy, including Chekhov, ever do anything that really touches another heart, you know, you, right. you, because it's authentic. You know, you're, yeah. you're really taking a chance. It's sort of like, uh, you know, I, 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 yeah, you're taking a chance and the reader feels that, I think. And especially if the, the way that you're taking a chance is infused with your desire to get some answer to a question you find urgent. Then I think mm. a lot will be forgiven, and and even if the if the if the product is a little shoddy or a little strange or a little funny or whatever, the sincerity, the intent will be felt, and I think that's really where we have to live. I don't think there's much else because I spent. Uh, I mean, I, my first book came out when I was 38, and part of the reason for that delay was that I was trying so hard to get it right in advance and make sure that my book didn't fall short of any of War and Peace before I wrote it. <laughs> you know, so that that's a way to end up doing nothing. You know. Yeah, but, but I think it's important to to note in, in what we're talking about with the lower half of the Barbie doll, it's not that ambition reconciles itself with a worse set of skills. It's just that it set, reconciles itself with your particular set of skills. Like, for example, there's many right. readers who don't want right. to read about a pheasant <clears throat> and they want to read about the Barbie doll. So, but I think writers go through this thing where they think that there's a certain set of skills which are the best or right set of skills or aesthetics. Right. Yeah. And also that, you know, part of it, our, our skills, your skills, my skills as people of this, who are on earth at this time have been adjusted and delimited and exaggerated based on the culture we're living in. So the, um, you know, you think about it in terms of music, you know, when, when punk music started, that was an intentional, um, it was an attempt with a kind of paucity of means to say something truthful about the culture that couldn't be said in any other way. So that's the other thing we have to be, you know, um, whatever skills you have or I have, they've come out of authentically out of our culture and out of our experience. And so it would make sense that any truth we told, any truth we could tell would be told in in that mode. So this is another thing about this book is you have to be a little cautious. And in in the class, too, I always have to sort of put out a, a disclaimer, like, don't try to use the exact techniques that Chekhov used because he was doing it spontaneously uh, out of his mm. Chekhovianness, you know. So it, it's fraught, you know, it's fraught with peril to admire other earlier writers too much. You have to be yeah. sort of on a little bit of a fader, like, well, I'm going to admire him and then I'm going to disavow him. You know, that sort of kill the father right. sort of idea. 
All right, so we're gonna move into audience questions after one more quick question. Um, so you can throw the questions up on screen after this, but um, George, I just was reading about your great kind of ambition and this long period of development of your own voice and everything um, as a young writer. And I just was very curious to ask you this question. If you can put yourself back in the mindset of say the 30 year old or 35 year old George Saunders and imagine that that George could look at the George that you are today and, and all the success that you've had. Um, what do you think the judgment would be of that younger version of yourself? And, and how is that judgment of success different than how you think of success now? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I know that I refer to him often, you know, because what I had an aversion to at that age was the, the writer, the older writer who was phoning it in you know, mm. and it was kind of trapped by his own shtick and his own dogma, you know, which, which that's a really a danger, you know? So I think that, um, he, what that person liked, especially the one who had started civil war land was the incredible freshness of the possibility of putting something new down on the page every day. You know, I was, I was at that time I was riding my bike to and from work on the Erie canal. And I just remember the feeling of like, okay, yes, I have a 10 hour engineering day to get through, but in there somewhere, I'm going to get 15 minutes of true freshness where I don't give a shit if I'm as good as any other writer. I don't care about Hemingway. I don't care. I just want to put down a fresh paragraph, you know? So that, mm. that kid, you know, 33 year old kid, um, might at times look askance at me, but I'm never looking askance at him. You know, I, re mm. I, re I remember him and I tre treasure him in heart, and I'm trying to get back to him every day, you know, in, in that sense. At the same time, I think he would agree with me that in the approach that I was using in Civil Warland, there was a limitation on it. And now what this guy is trying to do is, is maintain that freshness while getting a bigger uh, camera, you know, so that mm -hmm. positive emotions can get in and the full scope of life and so on. So I think he would basically... I think he'd be a little bummed out about the hairline, but other than that, I think we'd be, we'd be okay. <laughs> oh, that's he'd, great. He'd All be right, happy so to know that I own a, I own a Gibson SG. He'd be very happy with that because I couldn't afford it then and now I have one. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's have a few questions from the audience if we could. All right. Um, this is from Sylvia. I'm curious if Mr. Saunders anticipated the success of Lincoln and the Bardo and how does that level of success affect your future writing? Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, the answer is kind of yes and no. I th I have a, a way of, as I'm writing, sort of, yeah, sort of imagining the best case. You know, I think that does something to your eventual audience. If you say, yeah, I want I want a lot of people to be able to, to fit through this doorway. Um, mm. and same with this book. I was thinking, no, this there, it's ostensibly a dry topic, but I think I can make it so that people enjoy it. And I think if you have that kind of positive vision, uh, it affects the work, you know, at certain decision points where you're saying, well, there's an easy answer <clears throat> that will keep a lot of people out and let me maintain my badge of, as almost too edgy to read, you know, or there's another, uh, soul enlarging choice that says, no, yeah, I, I want, I want everyone to read it. So, so kind of, and then I, I, I have very low self-esteem, so success doesn't really hurt me that much. I'm just like, yeah, yeah sure, whatever. Um, <clears throat> so it, 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 I think it just basically gave me a little more chutzpah, you know, to say, well, okay, I wrote a novel that was successful. Oh, gosh, okay, uh, anything else you want to say? Yeah, yeah. So I think in that <laughs> sense, it's been, it's been good, you know, it's, it's been good. It, if, it's almost like it helped me compensate for uh, a certain... Um, you know, shyness, uh, aesthetic shyness. And mm -hmm. yeah, <clears throat> that's great. Okay. Um, let's, let's have two more questions. Um, is there a favorite short story or author from your childhood that still informs or inspires you today? Yeah, I would say it's um, Esther Forbes. She wrote a book called Johnny Tremaine and that was given to me by my third grade nun. Uh, and she, I think she saw that I was a good reader and she kind of pulled me aside and, and had checked this book out from the library for me. And it really meant a lot to me. And then I was, of course, like, oh, I hope I can read it. And um, it turns out it was the first book I'd ever read that really was written by a stylist. Forbes is a really wonderful writer. And so I, I, it makes me think, yeah, you know, as a third grader, I was writing in my head in Esther Forbes's voice already. So and it was beautiful. You know, I'd be sitting on the playground describing things happening in her voice. So it, it kind of just makes me think, 
Well, for whatever reason, neurologically, you, you're interested in style. So don't disavow that. Just keep, keep doing it, you know? Um, and it was a beautiful, it was a, you know, the, in this book, I talk a lot about the way that books connect us. And you imagine this is a, a young nun who I've never been able to track down, by the way. She's probably 23. She saw something in me. She went to the trouble of getting this book. She, she mm -hmm. presented it perfectly. She said to me, uh, she said that these, this magic sentence to any Catholic boy, the other nuns and I have been discussing you in the convent. Oh. Uh, and so she's, you know, through skillful means, she got me to read this really difficult book and she changed the course of my life. So yeah, you know, that's, wow. Beautiful. All right, let's do one more audience question. Um, do you ever feel conflict? Oh, Speaking of mothers, this is from my mom. <clears throat> thanks. Thanks for throwing this up guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do you ever feel conflict between you have a very two? nice fun, Patsy. <laughs> Um, do you ever feel the conflict between being true to yourself and your writing and wanting to write what you think your audience would want to read? You know, uh, thank you, Patsy. And you do have a very nice son. Well done there. Um, I, I don't actually, and I, I don't know. Uh, I think in the book, I talk about this a little bit. My, my game is to say, okay, who's my reader? <clears throat> my reader is me. If I hadn't read it already, which is another way of saying my reader is just as smart <clears throat> and, you know, similarly inclined to me, just as worldly, just as clever, just as good hearted, blah, blah, blah. Then you're writing to this version of yourself. Um, you're trying to write what you would like. So then there's no problem. It's just, and, it, and in a sense, it's a generous gesture. You're saying, well, I, you know, I don't want to imagine my readers being less than me. I, I just want to imagine that we're the same, you know, we're on the same wavelength. So then it, it hasn't really been a problem. Also for me, somehow, I, I don't, I haven't really thought through this, but there's a there's not a difference between f for me what would be popular and what would be me at my best i don't i don't know mm -hmm. why there there isn't or at least my my definition of popular like with lincoln and the bardo every time i thought i want everyone to read this i don't want it just to be <clears throat> a niche book the that would cause the, the the book to get more aesthetically ambitious instead of the opposite i that's probably not true for everybody but i know i know uh we i used to take our students to see an agent in new york and he said that he had a client who was a literary writer, kind of mid-list literary writer, never sold any books. And this guy said, damn it, I'm going to write a book like, and he named one of this agent's very, very best-selling romance novelist. And the agent said, okay, yeah, go ahead. So the guy went off for two years and tried this. And at the end, he came back so mad. I can't do it. And the agent said, of course you can't, because she believes it. That <clears throat> she, she calls this agent up crying in the middle of the night because her character just died you're faking mm. it so any <clears throat> any reader is going to feel that condescension so i think that's you know i i would say don't just pretend you, that it's the same you know for me that's how how it works right okay so nice we only story. have a <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, all right. So we, we only have a couple minutes left and I realized that I had teased something at the beginning. Talk about setups and payoffs, George. I mean, I have to like, you know, deliver what I promised the reader at the beginning of this call. Um, I had promised that I would say, tell you what George thinks are the two most critical things for success for a writer. And, and they are, drum roll please, a willingness to revise and an attention to causality like within the story. So George, in just a minute or so, can you explain yeah. these two critical features? Yes. And I would say neither one of them is by fiat. It's just, if you observe the form, uh, you know, so for example, so uh, if you revise, we talked earlier, you will have a chance to inflict your best self on the pros over and over and over again, you know, choosing day after day after day. That has the effect of making the pros become more like itself, more intelligent, more whatever. Uh, and most writers don't like to do it or they maybe don't do it quite radically enough. But if you can get in touch with that, uh, you'll your prose will be more like yourself and also you'll never have writer's block because you know that a first draft doesn't matter. That That's, you know. Uh, the second thing, there's something about, a. if we imagine a piece of fiction as a pot of water, you put it on the stove, you fill it with water, okay, uh, that's exposition. Any good writer can do that. You know, you just describe your childhood home or you describe Paris in the thirties or something. That's fun. The next step. And now here I always feel a little bit like, a, a, like too mechanical, but the truth is, and you'll see this in your own reading, then you get to make the water boil. 
you, you have to make things start to change. So you, you describe stasis and then it changes. Otherwise, it's not a story. I mean, and again, I don't mean to be like prescriptive, but I think that's kind of true. If I say, you know, Mark, I got up today and uh, went into the kitchen. And you're like, really? Okay. And I say, and then I sat down and I had breakfast. Yeah. I had, and, and I start listening to what I had. You, you're like, okay, this is not a story yet. So, <laughs> so the, the, this, but this ability to make things causal is really hard and it's not a natural talent. And some people have, have it automatically. Some people can never get it. Um, so one of the things, one of the charges I set to my students is let's see if we can figure out what your version of causality looks like. How do you prompt it? How do you, maybe a lot of times I just inadvertently do it. And, and the skill is to recognize that I've done it. And this relates to what we said earlier about what questions are you asking? And do you continue to ask that question? That's causality also, you know? So th these are all, these all sound a little aphoristic, but I do think those two things are uh, really, it's not about ideas. It's not about philosophy. It's not about politics. It's about, can you learn to revise in a way that's productive for yourself? And can you produce the illusion of causality and therefore meaning? That's really and, and I think like there's, advice. <laughs> there's this great uh, anecdote in the book where you talk about somebody asking a question to Robert Frost at some reading. And I think it was Robert Frost say, it's a complicated question about uh, the, the structure of a sonnet and so on. And he gets to the end of the question and Robert Frost just says, don't even worry about that, just work. You know, and I think that that was a great um, yeah. kind of summary. Um, but, but George, I do that, have to wrap. He says, Sorry, he says don't worry. I, I was going to say, he says, don't worry, work. And then years later, a Frost scholar pulled me aside and said, no, he didn't say that. He said, don't work, worry. So, <laughs> so that little segment is a great bit of writing advice. Whatever. Do this unless you don't. <laughs> um, all right. So we have to wrap. Um, folks, all these things are discussed at length and it, with such great beauty and frankly humanity um, in this book. Um, George, to wrap, I always ask authors the same question. Usually it's for a book of fiction, but I want to ask you anyway, even though this is nonfiction. And I just would say, imagine the ideal reader for your book. Imagine they are getting everything that you're up to. They understand just what you're going for and receiving this book in, a, in the way that you dreamed it would be received. When they finish this book, mm -hmm. describe for me in a word or a phrase, what is the feeling that this reader has? They're more interested in in everything, more, more alert, because that's how I feel when I finish any good book. I'm just like, ah, this world, you know, and it mm -hmm. might last for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. But that just the idea that and also that we're, you know, kind of a Mr. Rogers feeling like I like you and I hope you like me. And we're we just did something together that was kind of fun. And I hope it, it you know, it, it today, just today, it alters your trajectory a little bit and, you know, makes you more interested in things as they as they are, I guess. And also that you're inclined to buy 30 copies for your home library. That's the other kind of secondary thing. <laughs> buy 30 copies and you'll get all the feelings, folks. Um, yeah. All right, George, <laughs> this, this has been an incredible honor. Thank you. Um, you could, for as they too. say, you could have been anywhere in the world, but you chose to be with us. So thank you so much, folks. The, the book is uh, Swim in a Pond in the Rain. Please go buy it. It's absolutely fantastic. George Saunders, thank you so much.